interesting. You could turn to Ecclesiastes 12, and that's not where we'll start, but we'll end up there, and I want to give you a preview of what we're going to end up with. But uh, in Genesis chapter 2, look at this very familiar passage, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to speak on the subject of the sanctity of life, the sanctity of life. Now, this isn't an anti-abortion message. This is a pro-life message, how that life originated from God. And what happens when a nation starts going downhill is that uh, human life means less and less to them. Human life means less and less. And we're in that position today, aren't we? And I'm not speaking on our country's position. I'm speaking to believers so that we might understand these wondrous things. One of the things we're going to look at here today is how that we're a particular creation of God. Have you ever thought about that? You know, when I was a kid, I was short. I didn't grow much until I was about 16. Then I shot up to not very tall. Okay? Now, I always resented. I wanted to be taller than that. But you know what? The Bible tells me that God had everything to do with my, uh, my birth, my, uh, the very fact of conception. We'll see that today. You know what you can tell from that? You can see that God made you a special way. Now, I know that sin defiles us. I understand that. I know that habits um, uh, and all these things come upon us and, and age uh, hits us and all of that. But just realize that you are God's special creation. We're not an accident of nature. And that's a good thing to remember. In Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There's a whole bunch in that verse. We could preach five messages on that. I'm not going to today. But what set me thinking about that probably won't seem to be parallel to you. But in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, remember now thy creator. In the first place, we have that origin as being created of God. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. You say, well, I'm not young anymore. And only, uh, only just a few of us can say that, okay? We're not young anymore. But it says, remember the Creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come. Now, you can anticipate evil days coming because without a single doubt in the world, the world's trend has always been downward with God intervening occasionally and lifting us back up. Isn't that right? Okay, and it says, when thou shalt say, nor when the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. We're told to remember our Creator in youth so that when we get older, we won't be able to say, I don't care about the Creator and what His hold is on us. This is the wisest man on the face of the earth. Solomon was wise like that. At the end of a book that is very pragmatic, is very intellectual, it's philosophical, if you will, at the end of the book he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is giving us life uh, in this day, but one day we're going to answer for what we've done for Him or what we've done against Him. And that was spoken by the wisest of men for whom there was never a budget to do what He wanted to do. And if you ever wonder why there is so much of a push to destroy the minds of our kids in school, verse 1 tells you why. It says, um, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. When the youth grow up with the knowledge of God, they're less inclined to come to the end of their days and say, well, I'm not created. I, there's no God and I have no interest in spiritual things. That's what, how serious our job is as we are given the bundles of life that we're given, those children and grandchildren. Now, I want to speak on the sanctity of life today, and I want it to be a real blessing to you, comforting sometimes. I mean, uh, I want to be tall. I have nieces that say, uh, Uncle Don, can I reach that for you? <laughs> now, I'm not that short. I used to be almost 5'11". Almost. I don't think I reached that now, and maybe that was standing up better than I ever did in my lifetime. 
Uncle Don, can I reach that for you? Yeah, I really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. You know what? God made them tall and didn't make me tall. He missed a good opportunity. My dad's brothers are 6'4", and my mom's brother is 6'7", and I'm the shallow end of the gene pool, okay? But you know, I laugh about it because I don't care. I always tell my tall friends that all the tall guys in the Bible were losers. And you can think about that and realize it's true. But I can say this. If you're skinny, you wish you were heavier. If you're heavy, you wish you were skinny. If you're short, you wish you were taller. Tall people usually wish they were shorter. But do you realize that God formed us? We're not an accident. And for that awkward time in the midst of youth where uh, you compare yourself with others, which is, first of all, un, uh, not a good idea, but you realize that you were created by God. Isn't that a wondrous thing? And if you're saved, God made you anew. This should be a comfort to us. Let's pray. Lord, just bless this time. Give me the words to speak. And Father, may it be a blessing to everyone. And for all of us, help us to take our own lives, the life that you've given to us very seriously, and let us speak the words of life, liberty, uh, uh, fulfillment to the world around us with joy and gladness. In Jesus' name, amen. The sanctity of life. There are 8 billion, I saw this, it was posted by someone that I didn't expect it from. There are 8 billion people in this world, 8 plus, and 100% of them were born to a woman. Not 99.9, 100% were born to women, okay? The first man was made of dust, as we just read in Genesis. And I picture that in my mind, how that God uh, formed from this dust or clay. He formed a man uh, with much greater skill than Michelangelo had, much greater skill than the greatest of artists ever had. He formed a man in his own image. And then he breathed into his nostrils. That means he made nostrils there. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that... that um, figure became a living soul. That's an incredible thing. The first man was made of dust with no woman involved. Isaac was born to a woman too old to bear children. You can read that in Genesis 18. It had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. She was too old to bear. How did she bear a child? Because God controls the womb, doesn't he? Sometimes he shut the womb. Sometimes he opened them. Uh, Jesus was made of woman, Galatians 4, 4, with no earthly father because the Holy Ghost was his father. He was truly the son of God. See, God's the one that ordains life and God's the one uh, from whom all life comes. And that's a fact of, of nature. It's a fact of science. And if we wanted to go into it, I'd love to from uh, Hebrews, how the, we know that the things we see don't give us the indication of how we, where we came from. Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The scientist is not going to be able to discover God. You'll see why there should be a God, where there has to be a God, but you're not going to make an experiment that will display to God because that would be no faith. Origins come from faith, and aren't you glad you were trained to believe that there was a God? And some of the things we could look at would be wonderful. Number one, look at this. Life is God's domain. Life is God's domain. We came from dust. In fact, if you look at 103rd Psalm, verse 14, Psalm 103, this is good preaching, Psalm 103. But look at verse 14. It says this, For he knoweth, God knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Isn't that an incredible verse? God knows that we're just dust. We started out as dirt. And by the way, the modern scientists have come up with this great breakthrough that our bodies are comprised of the same thing that dirt's comprised of. Now, that's a surprise to all of you, isn't it? It's a surprise. Science eventually can't catch us up to the Bible, but uh, they really resist it as much as possible. He remembers we're just dust. Think about that. We don't have this auspicious beginning where a whole bunch of accidents happen and you became a man, Shazam. 
It doesn't happen that way. We started out as less than nothing, just dust. And God remembers that. But in Genesis 1.27, it says this. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created us in his own image. You have an idea what God looks like because the Bible speaks of God's hands, which was one of the messages I was going to preach. God's hands, they're wonderful. You can see how God can see us, and you can see all these things about God. There's some hints about God, and he sits on a throne, but we were made in his image, and there's more than just the visible there. It's certainly the tripart image. Uh, we know that. We were, we were made in his image. He fashioned us. Now, I've had the privilege of knowing some good artists. Uh, my, one of my uncles is an artist, and he did our first logo 40 years ago or so. Uh, my niece turned down a full scholarship for a Master of uh, Fine Arts to Stanford University. She just didn't want to go to that and get an MFA there. I asked another friend of mine who is an artist, and he said, man, take it. They only give out six or eight of those every year. Take it. And she wasn't that interested, but these artists ha can do absolute magic. They can do magic. They can take a piece of paper and put a pen on it and make that paper almost come to life. Why is that? It's an ability I have no idea about, but my Bible says that God fashioned man. Think about that. Do you ever wonder what Adam must have looked like? Well, as much as I'd like Nora to think he looked just like me, he didn't. He didn't. He was perfect, wasn't he? He was perfect, made in the image of God. And if it were important for us to know how tall he was or any of those things, it would have been recorded, but it's not. But we know this. He bore the Father's image. He bore the Father's image. And I used to see my friend Steve. He'd, he'd, he'd squint his eyes and look at something, and then he'd dry, draw it out, and it looked just... We'd go into a restaurant, and he'd draw a picture on the napkin of the waitress. And you had no problem knowing who it was. Pretty soon she'd come back and he'd sent, give that to her. And they've just found, it's fascinating, isn't it? But he couldn't possibly have had the artistic ability that the father had when he fashioned man. He fashioned man. You know, when you look at the whole subject of DNA, I just quickly looked at this. It's a double helix. D a DNA is an acid. It's uh, two chains in a double helix. And the genetic instructions for the development, the function, the growth, and reproduction of life are all tied up in that DNA. There are three billion pairs of complex codes in that DNA. And you're led to believe by the environment, the, uh, modern science community, that's an accident. Three billion codes. Three billion codes. And at the time that, uh, uh, I tried to find the exact time that DNA was there, but I know this, as soon as that life is viable, as soon as conception happens in the womb, the code's right there that the, the growth follows. It is determined far greater than a computer code. Computer codes pale by comparison, don't they? We, he fashioned us and made us so remarkably. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. He made us so remarkably that science still scratches their heads about it. We know the chemicals. I took some chemistry classes in high school. And the teacher, and his name, he was a retired major in the Air Force, and his last name was Minor. His name was Major Minor. And he'd go out with a jar after it rained and pick up a bottle of mud from the, uh, from the parking lot and come and give it to us, and we could analyze that and find out exactly what was in that water exactly what was there by different titrations and so on, what color would turn, what sediment came out. It's been a long time ago, I don't remember. We can come up with all the exact chemicals that man is made of. You could put all of them in a jar, and you could put them in the exact right order. You could do all of that, and you'd never get lied about. It's more than chemical, isn't it? We were made by God, 
And young people sometimes get concerned that, oh, they wish they were smarter, or they wish they were this or that, or they weren't this or that. God made you with a code so remarkable that they can't even figure it all out. In other words, he wanted someone just exactly like you on this earth. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Uh, he needed someone short for me, okay? Anyway, uh, we know those chemicals. We know, we know the acids, and I, I know that I looked at the makeup of uh, the uh, DNA, and it's, uh, I think it's amino, all kinds of stuff, amino acids and all this stuff, and it's absolutely necessary for life, but it's God alone that can breathe life into them. God alone does that, doesn't he? He breathes that life. We can split atoms, but we cannot breathe life into chemicals. We cannot breathe life into chemicals. And any honest scientist would have to come to that conclusion. Why? Because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made us. God made us. Think of the joy it is when a young couple gets married and pretty soon they invite that first of their children into their home. And we all ooh and ah over that child. And even though I wasn't that sort of a guy, when I had a child, my first son, when he came, I probably ooed and ah your brain turns to mush, okay? And grandkids, even more so. I was with a couple of my grandkids last week. It's even more so, isn't it? And you know, we don't, we don't figure that they just decided to be a human when they were born. We were excited from the moment of conception, and we looked with rejoicing till they came out and we could hold them in our hands. We can split atoms, but we cannot breathe life into any chemicals. Breath quickened the spirit. God's breath quickened the spirit. Now, I've heard some people erroneously say, well, um, when he breathed, he became a soul. Well, yeah, he became a soul then, but that's not because he was trying to liken that to a birth of a baby. When that baby takes its first breath, becomes a soul. No, it's not true because that baby had to have oxygen before. The mother was breathing for that baby, okay? It's God who quickens that soul, and everyone saved or lost, everyone, no matter how their walk is in this world, everyone traces their existence to that first creature of God called Adam. Secondly, life is sacred to God. Life is sacred to God. We know how sacred it is to us, but we pale by comparison, don't we? In Genesis chapter 4, I've gone to this place many times, but Genesis chapter 4, after Cain rose up and slew Abel, verse 10, it says this, And God said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. That means his blood had a voice. I'm not trying to animate blood, but I know this. There is blood that's shed sometimes. There's a time for war, isn't there? A time to put to death, a time to quicken. But there is a time when innocent blood is shed, and that innocent blood cries out to God according to this verse. Our nation is horribly guilty of that, isn't it? Horribly guilty of that. Abel's blood cried. I've often thought about this what it must have been for Adam to live 900 more years. I don't know how old he was when Cain and Abel were born, but in round figures, he lived 850 or 900 more years. And one of the first things that's recorded after his fall, because that was chapter 3, this is chapter 4, one of his sons murders his brother. Very, very likely a twin brother. Very likely so. Murdered his brother. And every time he saw war here, every time he saw strife, and every time he saw a disappointment, every time he saw that he knows that sin uh, came from his rebellion against God. By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Adam had a wonderful creation. His origin was by God designing a body out of clay and breathing into it the breath of life. But you know, since that time, we've been born in Adam's image, haven't we? 
We've been born in Adam's image. And that image is one that has an appointment with death. Adam's didn't originally. In fact, he was put from the garden so that he wouldn't go and take of the tree of life and live forever. How terrible it would have been to get older and older and older and older. I'm a thousand years old, and I'm not like I used to be, but there's no hope because you'd keep living if you'd taken from that tree of life. No, God mercifully uh, ends our life one day. Abel's blood cried. And it is all over your Bible. You can look at Deuteronomy 19 for lack of time how that the ground cries with its innocent blood. The ground cries with its innocent blood. Why do you suppose murder is so obviously to be addressed by death, by execution? Why is that? Because there's blood crying to God for, for uh, uh, justice. Because God considers life that he gave, that he made to be uh, uh, precious, Leviticus 17, it says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Why do you suppose it is that uh, our redemption required the shedding of blood? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Because the life of our flesh, we owe our physical life for our sin. And one day that physical life without Christ would awaken in hell, just like Luke 16 speaks of, and there's no deliverance from that place. It's too late then. You can't go to purgatory and hope you can pay for your sins yourself. So it needs to have a blood shed. When Steve was in Luke this morning, isn't it incredible that he told his disciples, he spoke to them about the death he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, when we die, we don't ever think it's really an accomplishment. Your life was an accomplishment, hopefully a good one. But Jesus came for the purpose of dying for us. Why? There had to be the shedding of blood that was innocent, bearing my sin and my shame, that I might have that covering of that blood to uh, forgive me of my sin. He accomplished a death there. He accomplished a death in that hounds of hell were around him. The devil had, uh, had uh, tempted him. The devil's minions had betrayed him. His disciples had forsaken him and all the other things that were inherent in his death. God had forsaken him. Why hast thou forsaken me? He accomplished a death with far greater opposition than we can even imagine or write down. Life of the flesh is in the blood. But then look at this, Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And I know that especially young people, they... Uh, would like to change. They'd like to change some things. And uh, we always want to get better, don't we? But I can tell you this, to know that God created you is a wonderful truth, isn't it? God created you, and God, uh, with very few exceptions, if there are any, God created someone for you to live your life with. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a wonderful thing? That means you are a special creation for someone else who's a special creation, and your lives can be blended together when you love the Lord Jesus Christ and serve Him. That's just one of those wonderful thoughts, isn't it? Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, under the heading, life is sacred to God. Look at verse 5. The word came unto him in verse 4, before I formed thee in the belly. I knew that now God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. But then he says, before I formed thee in the belly. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, this isn't talking about salvation like in our age, but God called this, young, this man, before he was even born, he ordained him to be what we call the weeping prophet. If you don't think that life is sacred... If you don't think that life began before birth, then there's something wrong with you. You don't believe what the Bible says. I formed you in the womb. I formed you. When we've had visitors here from, from churches my parents have gone to, and trust me, I'm the talkative one in the family. We had a fellow come one time and says, hey, we didn't know the, uh, that your dad had, had kids that... 
that, uh, that um, I said, you mean talk? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I didn't talk till I was two and a half years old. They thought I was retarded. I'm not sure they were wrong, okay? But I know this, my two older sisters, I know what it's like to have an older sister, okay? My two older sisters and my parents just prayed that I'd start talking, so it's their fault. Okay? They never prayed for me to be rich. They never prayed for me to have uh, fancy uh, cars. They prayed that I'd talk, and I guess that was answered pretty well, wasn't it? You understand that he was formed in the womb. In a sense, that's we know that's God's handiwork, isn't it? God's handiwork. You think about that. You ever think about, there, there are people that I know when we're saved, we're given gifts. Some are administrative gifts and some are uh, gifts of, of, of um, uh, fellowship gifts. I, I'm not coming up with them right now, but we're given different gifts. But you know, talents are given to lost people too. Have you ever thought about the talents that were given to artists or musicians? I, I'll tell you, it, besides our Bibles and our family, the piano in our house is the thing that's most precious to me. It is going all the time, all the time. And it's not contemporary music. It's old hymns of the faith and things that, that just thrill your soul. It's a joy to me. There are people that are lost that have musical ability, and I hate every one of them. You understand that? I'm being facetious, of course. Why is it? I mean, I hear about two-year-old children that can play pianos. I know Mozart wrote his first major piece at four or five years old. God, God gave people gifts and talents. Now, when we're saved, he makes up the difference and gives us some others, doesn't he? But it's amazing how some people have the ability to do music. Some have the ability to do artwork. And some have the ability to think mechanically and electrically and all, all this other stuff. But God makes us in a fearful and wonderful way, doesn't he? And that doesn't mean, I mean, because... Someone to take, well, God made me like this. That doesn't give us a reason for pride. It should give us a, a confirmation of ownership who owns us. And we think about all the talents that God gives to us, and you'll stand before God for that. What about the abilities that the world's been given and they don't surrender them to God? Surrender them to God. Jeremiah, Jeremiah testifies to us that we're God's handiwork. God's handiwork. God made me with short legs so that my wife could laugh at me all the time. It's just amazing to me. She laughs that my legs are getting shorter. And I say, they still reach the ground. And then I get into the car after she's driven, you know. If I have short legs, wouldn't that mean that hers are longer? I try to get in the car and the wheel is so close to the seat, I can't get in there. And so I realize that she drives in the command position like this. I don't. You know, we laugh about stuff like that. And I just, I just know that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And he made you for a purpose. He made you with talents that not everyone else has the combination that you have. And God made you uh, to acknowledge him as the giver of life and the blessing of your life. And when you get saved, what a joy to give that back to God, isn't it? What a joy. Here I am, Lord. I'm not much, but what I have is yours. We're formed, aren't we? But that means we're planned. We're ordained. There's purpose for our lives. You know what our purpose in life is? To bring glory to God, isn't it? What did you do in this last week that glorified God? What did you do to glorify God? That's a fair question. If you don't glorify God with your life, wasn't that day pretty much wasted? Wasn't that day pretty much wasted? Number three, new life is God's domain. New life is God's domain. Romans 5, 12 says, From one man, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, 
for that all of sin. Adam is the one. People say, well, if it weren't for Eve, we'd be back in the garden. No, that's not true. She sinned, but she was deceived. Adam sinned intentionally. By one man, sin entered into the world. What did he do? He saw that his wife was dying. He chose to die with her. Now, that's a pretty good type of Christ, isn't it? Except for the sin. But it's because we're children of Adam that we all inherit that sin nature. It's a blood problem that has to be cured with blood. Our sin comes from Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 says, the first man, Adam, in fact, I want to read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the chapter on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it says, is so, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The last Adam is, is Jesus. And he is, the, he is the last Adam because he restores the life that Adam lost. Isn't that a wondrous thing? Isn't that a wondrous thing? One of the common themes when we were in that meeting last week over by Seattle was, well, it was renewing your passion. Hey, marriages need their passions renewed, don't they? Say, well, no, we're in love. Yeah, I know, but you still need to spend some time together, keep that passion the way it's supposed to be. Well, as our walk with the Lord goes, we need to renew our passion for Him too over and over again, don't we? Because our hearts are so prone to grow cold. The Bible explains that. It reveals that every, on every page, doesn't it? Life comes from Jesus. But the pall of death and darkness is settling more and more upon us, isn't it? You look around you and you see death is more and more apparent. And I don't just mean people are dying. I mean the, the optimism, the enthusiasm for life is fading. We were on the street the other night, last time for the year. I didn't get to go as much as I wanted this year, but if people will stand up for perversion, why wouldn't you stand up for Jesus? Why wouldn't you stand up for Jesus? And people would come by, and a few of them would honk and say nice things, and some would honk and not say nice things. And for each one that would go by, they'd rev their engine up and make as much noise as they could so you couldn't hear the preacher. Like, that's the first time anyone's ever thought of that. But you know, every once in a while, that testimony, or maybe the words on a sign you're using, or a, a few words that come from the preacher, they touch your soul and rattle you. That's what we want, that someone would get saved. Andrea got saved during the street preaching, didn't we? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not here, no. But uh, um, isn't it wonderful to stand up for Jesus? The new life comes from God. Well, our country needs to hear a clear testimony of Jesus Christ, a clear testimony, because the darkness is settling over our nation, isn't it? Hey, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this. It's not the politician's fault. Sure, they're making it worse. But Christians have started fighting each other and Christians have started being divisive. And there's a place for division, isn't there? There really is. But then all the cults come out and try to trick people. And, and, uh, and then you'll see preachers that once stood for the truth and now they've walked away from what they claim to have believed before. And it's like this world has no hope. I can tell you there's hope in Jesus, isn't there? I can tell you without a doubt that he's worth serving. I can tell you without a doubt that you'll never regret the day you trusted him as Savior. And my day was in 67, a long time ago. It's wonderful to trust him. The need is apparent. What's amazing to me is people will go through this life and and they're miserable. There's not enough money at home. There's unhappiness at home. Even if they have a decent marriage without Jesus, and there are maybe some sort of like that, every day is drudgery, and there's nothing to look forward to, and the news media is going to keep you feeding on poison. But boy, when you read your Bible, you know what you see? That 
Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You're going to see in your Bible that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You'll see in your Bible, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. To as many as believed on his name, think about that. Of all the things that Jesus owns, he says, I want you to join, own them jointly with me. Those things are wonderful truths, aren't there? But in this world, hearts are hardened. You can preach those words of life, and it used to be that some people would listen. But now it's getting rarer and rarer and rarer. I had more uh, success inviting people to church in Los Angeles than I do here. By far. By far. I don't know if it's still that way. I don't want to go back there to find out. You know? The, the sun is setting, as it were. And the sad thing is, the saints are indifferent. See, I don't think, I don't think that um, just the saints were known before they were formed in the womb because that, after all, is Old Testament, isn't it? I think man is a special creation of God, and he forms them as he wills. He forms them. And we're, our brains are too puny to understand all of that. But he forms man. He forms them. And when the saints are indifferent to sin, the gospel preached to them, you know what it's going to do? Well, how will they hear without a preacher? What it does is it hardens our hearts. Well, that's their problem. They can deal with it. Hey, my sin was Jesus' problem, and he dealt with it. Saints are indifferent. In every age that that revival comes, it's when God's people repent and do something. In general, John 1.1, 1, 1, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, I know uh, he gave physical life. It's talking about spiritual life. The only spiritual life you're going to get is from Jesus. It's not by going to a mountain in the Himalayas and chanting. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life, and that light is, a, hit on, is put on a hill so people can see it. In him was life. And what I love is John 10 is one of my favorite passages. It's not just life. It's not just eternal life. It's abundant life. It's abundant life. I got to see preachers that I don't see for years. And I'm sorry, and that was a week ago, a little over a week ago. I'm sorry that we're all getting old. And I'm sorry that probably half a dozen of my preacher friends now are dealing with cancer. Okay? But I'm not sorry that there are young men raised up to preach the gospel today. Young men that are preaching and no, there aren't as many surrendering as there once were. But there are young men preaching and doing a great job. Aren't there? You see, he gives us abundant life. He gives abundant life. I remember Spurgeon walking in the woods one time with one of his best friends. I don't know if he's his publisher or not, whom he made rich, by the way. Um, they were laughing. and He looked to his friend and he said, you know, let's just stop for a moment and thank God for laughter. You ever thank God for laughter? You don't always feel like laughing. You know, the burdens we bear, not everyone sees the burden that are on the burdens that are on your heart when you come in the doors here. And there are times when uh, in Proverbs 14 it says, in backsliding, I'm not talking about backsliding, but in backsliding, the heart's sorrowful. And sometimes the smile on your face doesn't reach your eyes. Isn't that right? And sin will do that. Paul spoke of his first epistle to the Corinthian church, and he says, uh, it, it made you sorry. I'm glad it made you sorry, but because you sorrowed after a godly fashion. Hey, sometimes reading the Bible will make you sorry, and that's a good thing if you repent. But abundant life comes through Jesus, doesn't it? And sometimes we don't feel like laughing. That's probably because we're caught up in our own burdens and it's natural that we're going to have burdens. What our kids and our, our friends need to see is 
whatever the burden is, we're going to go through it and let God have his perfect work in our lives. Number four, this might seem a little bit odd, but children are God's heritage for us. Children are, are God's heritage. Psalm 127, three ch children are a heritage of the Lord, aren't they? What a joy. My second son will be with us next week, next Sunday. And I was thinking about that this morning. I'm pretty sure that one piece of plywood up there in the rafters out here was where he was lying in wait for you with a bucket of water when you came home from work. It's still in there, in the attic. And she's smarter than that. And I think um, he didn't come out very well on that one. Okay. But when you think about your kids, mine are in four or five, di four different states. When you think about your kids, they're our heritage, aren't they? And I want my kids to do a better job of life than I have. If they do that, it's not going to make me mad. It's going to make me glad. I want them to do better than I did. I want them to avoid mistakes I've made. Why do you suppose God wrote his word? So that we would be able to learn from mistakes of others, and we rarely do. God entrusted us with these dear children. What a joy that is. I remember as if it was almost yesterday where Jonathan would go to sleep on my chest while I was in the rocking chair, and those were great days. Now his grandson, his son is almost too big. He can't fit on my chest now. The years fly by so fast. But there's something that one of God's greatest physical gifts to us and their special creations, God gives them gifts and talents, gives them intellect. I didn't say education necessarily. God gives them abilities, and we should be grooming those for God's service. We can't get saved for them. I wish we could. But boy, when spiritual things are important to us, there's a much greater chance they'll be important to our kids, won't they? And the sweet day that comes when your grandkids trust Christ as Savior that's almost without description to be able to rejoice in that day. God entrusted us with those children. God instructed us. God instructed us in how to raise them. Now, if you'll go back to Ecclesiastes, and I don't have time for this. I'm already a little late. But if you go back to Ecclesiastes, you'll see, I think I must have been already there, and I turned from it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, where it says, <clears throat> man, I'm having trouble finding it now. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. He had done everything you could do as a man. There was no budget. He could build anything he wanted. He could go anywhere he wanted. He could make anything match anything else he wanted. He could get all the skillful laborers from other nations. There was no budget to what he did. Yet his own son split the kingdom from foolishness. And he says part of these chapters is that you don't know how your son, you're going you're gonna to make all these accomplishments if that's all you care about and you'll surrender it to your son. You don't know if he's a fool or not. I don't know if he was anticipating Rehoboam. I don't know. But I know this. After you think about a life of indulgence, after you think of a life of of flesh and indulgence and after being gifted so much in particular the fact that God showed himself to him twice. And he went after idols. And he says, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. There are people today that make it a, a point to try to Get away with sin. Get away with rebellion. Aren't those secret things? The bottom line is this. God made man upright. Man invented sin, didn't we? By sin, by one man's sin, sin entered into the world. And he gives us a new life in Christ. He gives us abundant life. He gives us the spirit of God indwelling us. He gives us his word to direct our steps. And the example of Solomon comes somewhat short of the New Testament, doesn't it? 
I don't mean that it's less. I just mean that the prophets in the Old Testament saw a day that was coming that not everything they would enjoy, but it would happen that day. That's First Peter. But you can look back on these things and realize Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Psalms and all those things, those give us some instruction to make our life uh, profitable to the Lord in this world. New life in Christ. The bottom line is fear of God, isn't it? Have you been born again? Remember when my aunt opened that Bible and showed me the gospel with my siblings and I trusted Christ as Savior. Man, I've given him every reason to throw me out of the family and he never has. What a great God. What a great God he is. And he'll do the same for you, but I've never regretted getting saved. Any regrets I have is not surrendering sooner or um, my attention diverted or whatever it might be, but I've sure never regretted getting saved. Made all the difference in my life for all of eternity. Are you saved today? If you died right now, do you know you'd go to heaven when you, at that time? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Do you have that hope? I mean, when you're ready to see Jesus, then you hope that it'd be today. If you're saved and you know you're living in sin, you hope it's not today. Because you hate to be caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Oh, you're not going to lose your salvation. But I sure want to be found with my boots in the saddle, don't you? And you know, what great purpose God puts in our lives. I had no intention of being a preacher. There are lots better, probably lots worse. I wanted to be an engineer. But man, what a joy to serve Jesus. What a joy. Do you know Jesus? And that joy is not just the day I got saved. It's every day since then when I open my Bible and God speaks to me personally as if he recognizes me. He does. Was there a day you trusted Christ as Savior? so that you know without a shadow of a doubt, not because you're worthy of it, but because Jesus saved you, you're going to go home to heaven. Do you know that each day you have a chance to fellowship with him and you take advantage of that? Do you know that you can be a blessing to others and you take advantage of that? God gives us purpose. And you know, maybe the bottom line is, how are we training children? Not just the children in our home, but the children in our classrooms the children that we get to influence, grandkids, all those things. We need to do business with Jesus. Right now is the time. If I can be a help, give me that chance. Let's pray. Lord, sure, thank you for your goodness. Bless your word now and make it find a lodging place in each heart. Whatever decision needs to be made, let that decision be obvious. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing 250, God's final call. 250, first and last, 250. If you need to do business, come on up to us. songs the invitation songs i don't drag out invitations at least almost never do i do so but if i can ever be a help please give me that chance and i'd be glad to
help you any way I could. It's good to have you here today. Come back tonight at 6, and Art, why don't you close for us?